Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Nico Peper from Bosch Engineering. And I'm here today um, because I have the vision that we can bring Linux into core automotive um, hardware and software. And I like, don't like to leave, leave the field to closed source, op um, closed source operating systems, microkernel based from professional vendors. I think there is a chance to bring Linux in core systems. And one major point to come into core systems is the um, automotive functional safety topic where we need to move into. So who am I? Um, I'm from Bosch Engineering, working on automotive systems for now 15 years, developing braking systems, steering systems, powertrain applications, and I'm today working in connectivity solutions for core systems. And so I think I have a plenty good overview about our business, and I'd like to share some of my knowledge with you. So first of all, does who, whom of you is had already contact with automotive systems engineering. Okay. And whom of you did ever work on a Linux system on a motive, in an automotive core system like a braking system? Nobody. And that's the way, and that's what we're talking about. So this is my agenda for my talk. Um, I like to emphasize why I think automotive software is special. Um, I will give you a really, really, really short overview um, what automotive um, safety means. And then I'd like to introduce an example to make it better to understand. And then I will show you how we think a functional safety level SLB may be um, implemented on a traffic light. I will show you some of the open topics that are not um, solved from my point of view, and I will come to my conclusion. So, why is automotive software special? We had on the last um, ELC in Berlin, there was the panel discussion, and there was raised the question, is automotive software special? And sometimes you hear the opinion, no, it isn't. And I think it is special because we have special requirements for our systems. Y to understand the automotive industry, you need to know that this is a really closed source based business. No one likes to get looked into his source code. If you define really your own um, property software, normally our business is not willing to share that. And on the other hand, we see that license obligations are for many of our customers a very heavy burden. Yes. Just doing so? Okay. So um, the topic the topic of the license obligations is often really a problem where our customers forbid in their specifications that we use open source licenses, for example, GPL v3. And I learned in this, um, on this conference that there are companies who think that is not a burden, um, but in many, many projects we see that is a blocking point. And then what we also hear in this conference is the lifetime. Normally, an automotive system needs to be powered for 15 years. And um, you all know 15 years life cycle for a product, uh, there is no solution available on the table now. I think we are making a clear push to it, but it's an open question. And our industry is very, very, very um, cost sensitive, and we need to have a high scalability. You know, if you have a bug in a car software and you get a recall for, for example, a VW Golf, and it's really a heavy burden for a company to pay what needs to be paid. And to, um, to tackle that, we are a very, very strongly process-oriented um, business, and it's our fundamental approach to cover everything with development processes. And last but not least, there's the functional safety topic. We have the ISO 262, which is, um, in our opinion, um, a legislative point of view. So if there is an accident, for example, caused by a failure in the software, then if you come to the legislation, if you come to the judge, you will be asked, are you developing your systems according to the ISO 262? And if you don't, then you have a problem. So that is the specialty of automotive software. And that is why we need to track things a little bit more different than other companies or other industries. So when we talk about functional safety, um, what we do is we need to avoid hazards. 
and we need to avoid the hazards that are above the tolerable risk. So when we talk, talk about functional safety in the automotive context, um, there are three main factors which influence the probability of a hazard. So it's the extent of the damage, the severity. We are looking to the probability, the situation, and um, the occurring risk, and the uncontrollability of the system when a failure occurs. To give you an example, if you have a car, and your car is back-wheel driven, and you have a standstill on the rear axle, then the car is much more heavy to, to control than if you have a front-driven car where your back axle is um, blocked. So that, needs, that means that um, depending on the controllability, you also get a risk increase. And if you come above the, the line of the tolerable risk, um, the ISO 2662 26 um, introduced four safety integrity levels, A to D, and normally um, the entry point for a system to come to safety is an ASIL B. So if we like to get a Linux system on an automotive core system, then often we are talking about an SLB and to reach SLB. When the norm was introduced, SLD was really, really critically discussed, and they, the common mind in the industry was, oh, to reach SLD is quite difficult, probably Im um, impossible, but today, today we have SLD applications in the field, for example, um, dual clutch transmissions, um, back axle driven, and we are able to handle that. But the first step is try two baby steps, reach an SLB, and then we will see what's necessary to reach further steps. So let me now come to an example to get it a bit more um, practical from the discussion point of view. I'd like to give you an example about um, our activities in the V2X. Um, area and why Linux is playing an important role in it. So what's V2X? We're talking about V2X um, when we talk about the communication between cars, commonly no, normally known as car2x, and for the communication of the cars with the infrastructure. And V2X is a clear enabler for autonomous driving and advanced driving um, assistance systems. Um, because many of the functions are not able we are not able to implement those functions if we are not able to have a direct communication link between the participants of the system. And what's happening in the US right now is um, that the government is really pushing into a V2X legislation. Um, we think the standard will be released soon. It may take some additional time because of the different standards that arise. And I think also the governance in the US is now a little bit waiting which standard will be the one to set on. And to power V2X communication, we normally have communication stacks. There are a handful of um, software companies who provided already professional stack support, and all those stacks, which we know, are POSIX-based specs, uh, POSIX, POSIX -based, uh, implementations. So it is a high probability um, that we use a Linux system to run those stacks onto it. And the specialty, if you look to V2X and the uh, handshake with the autonomous driving is that we get really complex systems um, that need to be handled and where you need a lot of um, calculating power in the car and in the infrastructure to handle your systems. And all that um, is, in my opinion, a clear sign for entering Linux into core automotive systems. And if you talk about V2X and autonomous driving, then we are talking about um, functional safety critical systems. So let's come from the general V2X to an example um, how V2X could work. You may think of, an, um, of a junction um, where we have this traffic light, and you probably know the function of the um, adaptive cruise control, where your car accelerates and decelerates um, depending on your car that is driving before you. So what would happen if we begin to let the car talk to the traffic light directly? Then you could easily implement functions like decelerating your car um, on a red traffic light. So your car is automatically decelerating and automatically accelerating in case the traffic light is switched to green again. So that is a simple function. Another function which is very handy is um, a green wave system. 
So your car is driving to a traffic light with 50 kilometers an hour. The traffic light is red. You know the traffic light will switch to green in three seconds. And your car decelerates decently, not to a standstill, but um, to a lower velocity. The traffic light switches to green, and your car goes above the traffic junction um, in a smooth way. That will save time, it will save, um, and it will save, this, it will save the environment because we do, don't need the full stops. If we take a look to such a system, we see the following. On the left-hand side, we see the system level, um, where the car um, and the traffic light are communicating to each other. And on the other hand, we take a look into the traffic light control system. That could be easily done on a modern microcontroller like an IMX7, and it is quite easy to power a um, Linux on it. So what we have is, we have a power stage where we control the lights with, and we have something like a V2X interface where we calculate the data stream um, for the communication and put it through the modem to the air. But if we begin to power such a system um, with a Linux, um, then we come to the ob obstacles um, that are typical for our industry. First of all, okay, are we willing to use open source versus closed source in this case? That could be a management decision, and I think that is not the biggest obstacle. The second point is the real-time um, behavior. So today, if you think of a traffic light, it needs to um, be able uh, to give its um, data in a time frame for about 500 milliseconds. That is why, because why? Normally, humans uh, are able to have a reaction time of one second. So to operate um, traffic light with a deterministic behavior of 500 milliseconds is feasible. That's easy with today's hardware. It's easy to do it with Linux. It's no problem. But now, this, the traffic light is directly talking to a car. And this car main function the um, autonomous driving function or the ADAS function is normally calculated on a 10 millisecond base. So now we need a deterministic behavior of the system which is lies in this 10 millisecond base. Sure, we will handle that with um, the increased um, probabilities and the increased uh, power of the hardware and I think also we will get that um, with the real-time behavior of the Linux but today it's an obstacle too. So, and then is the question, are we able to operate this traffic light really with a Linux system? What do you think? So let's take a look if we are able to do that. If we are able to operate this system with an embedded Linux. On software implementation point of view, it's easy, it's simple, we may do that. But we need to tackle the ESL functionality and we target on an um, automotive safety integrity level of B. And I like now show you how such a view could be. So you see again, we are talking about this traffic light that is talking to a car directly for deceleration and acceleration compared to the traffic light color, and we operate it on a Linux-based system. So when we try to get an ASIL B, first of all, Normally, our industry tries to get it via process. And there will be, in future, also um, safety-certified Linux systems available, but that is a, some time ago. Uh, we will need some time to reach that. So, but how could we implement such a system now, today? And then, for that, it is important that we introduce a system functionality view, a system engineering view to the system to abstract the operating system and operating system capabilities from the system behavior. What we need to do with our system is that we need to reduce the hazard, hazardous risks um, by um, reducing the probability when these risks occur. And if a uh, failure occurs on the system, that may happen, then we need to be able to go to a, to a safe state um, to allow to, or to, um, to hinder that any other problems occur. And that is on the traffic light quite an easy thing. A traffic light that is not working needs a yellow blinking light. And that information needs also to be available on the air. And for that, we need state-of-the-art safety measures on functional level um, to safely operate this vehicle and the traffic light. 
But how could we come to a functional view of the system so in a way that we are able to handle that? Because system requirements may be very, very numerous. So from our point of view, um, and you might agree to that, um, we can um, build it, uh, um, a IT system out of three building blocks. It's the data and the system control, it's the data flow, and it's the data processing. And we think if we are able um, to achieve a safety integrity for each of these building blocks, um, then we are able to handle the complete system in a safe way. And I will now go into some details how such a thing could look like. Um, if we take a look to the data flow, so the V2X um, data exchange between the traffic light and the car. So if we need, if we like to have a safe data um, exchange, we need um, to ensure that the data is valid for the traffic light. So it's quite easy to understand how could we um, ensure this safety target. Um, we can do it by, for example, implementing checksums, CRCs, or HMAC time of stuff. So everyone does that. That's not rocket science. So if you take a look to our embedded system, how would that look like? You see, we have our uh, traffic light that is powered via the relay. We introduce a first level of software. We call it level one. And then this functional level, um, we calculate the traffic light phases and the timing. And um, to ensure that our counterpart is receiving valid data, we pack, for example, a CRC um, onto the data flow and then hand it from the functional um, component to the V2X interface. Then the V2X interface is able to recalculate the CRC. It sees it's valid and then it puts it to the air. And on the other hand, in the car, you may also recalculate the CRC, and then you are sure that your data is uh, valid. So that is the easy way. That is the first thing of um, safety integrity measure, which is quite easy to implement. Now let's take a look to the data processing. Um, for example, if we like to put the, the data uh, the, the status of the traffic light um, to the radio, um, we need to be ensured that, not, that there are not calcula calculation-based errors um, are present in our system. And you all know that bit errors are possible, there are rounding errors possible, and there are also overflow errors possible. If we do a perfect testing, we may reduce stuff like that to nearly zero. Um, but there is a risk risk, and we like to reduce this risk. What can we do for that? Um, one could try to implement functionality in a redundant way, or in a, um, for example, by calculating based software in a second way, um, where you, for example, use other data structures or data types. How could that look like in our embedded system? So we see, again, we have the level one, where we calculate the traffic um, light phase and the timing, and now we introduce a new level, a level two. And in this level two, for example, we do a um, redundant calculation. To stay at the example from before, you remember we calculated in CRC to ensure that the data integrity is given. So what one could do, for example, is in the level one area, you calculate your CRC by, for example, the shifting algorithms. In the level two, you calculate your CRC, for example, in the table point of view, so in um, data table base. Then, if you see if both calculations are the same, your calculation is ensured, and then you have um, monitored your second level, you're sure that you have no bit errors or rounding errors in your software, and you may ensure the functionality. Now, let's take a look to the data system control. So what we do is um, we operate the traffic light and the color state, and, uh, and we need to ensure that this state control is working correctly. How do we do that in embedded software? Normally, if you have to control a state, use a state machine. So every one of you is um, doing that, and it's easy to implement. But how do we monitor a state machine? So that's quite easy, because what you can do is you may calculate the forbidden states of your state machine. And if your system enters a forbidden state, you're also able to detect that and then to counteract. So 
again, we are taking a look to our system, um, which is quite well known at this point. We have our traffic light phase monitoring or control. And in this traffic light phase control, we implemented a system state. So we know all the transitions that are valid from green, yellow, red, and again to green. And now it's quite easy to monitor this system. So we take again, um, take a look into our level two software, which is here indicated by this green box. What we now do is we do monitor the system for the forbidden states. For example, if the traffic light um, has a status which is green and red at the same time, we know that this state is forbidden, and then we are able to shut down the system to our safe state again. So that was all the easy stuff. So everyone knows how to implement a, um, a CRC, everyone knows how to implement a state machine and how to monitor it. But now um, we have the problem that we not also need to control the system control and the real-time integrity of the system. So what we need to ensure is that the light the real traffic light status and the, the status on the air um, are the same status. And this um, adds another topic where we need to ensure that the real-time behavior is running correctly. And this is the point um, where we at the moment um, are running um, in, it in this way that we not do it in a Linux system by itself because we think that we are a little bit apart from this real-time deterministic behavior. So what we introduce is a second entity that ensures that the real-time behavior and the complete system behavior is working correctly, and we implement it in a way we call the deadline monitoring. How does this look like? So first of all, normally we implement it on a second microcontroller area, so that is state of the technology in our, uh, in our business. So you take something like an um, IMX7 M4 um, edition, you may put any other safety relevant controller to it. Um, from cost point of view, it's possible. And um, this second entity, the microcontroller, which is powered by a typical real-time operating system with a real-time scheduling, you know you have a deterministic behavior of 10 milliseconds, um, so you're sure that your real-time behavior of this entity is working fine. But you do not overcrowd this controller with functions, you just put monitoring functions to it. So first of all, um, we take a look to the real-time behavior. So um, the microcontroller takes a look to the real-time behavior. It measures it between his expectations. And again, if we see that the deadline monitoring um, is not sufficient, that the system, the main processor, is not working in a time scale we are expecting, then again, we are able to dis disengage um, the calculation and to put the system to a safe state. The other thing which we need to ensure is, do we really operate the correct traffic light color? So did everything went correctly, for example, with the power stage, with the relay? And for that, we introduce what you see below in this line below, um, also a hardware feedback from the traffic light, so that we, to for any time of the system, we know that the state of the traffic light is as we expected. So if we want a red traffic light, and we want to put this data on the radio, um, we know by measuring the feedback from the um, traffic light, yes, we are on a red state, and yes, our system is working correctly. So what you have seen here in the three straps um, is what we call a three-layered monitoring system, and that is the state of the art of monitoring for a lot of core automotive systems. For example, an engine control software is powered um, by such a three-level system. An ESP system is incorporated in this. And this is, in the abstract way, um, how that works. You have your data input, and you have your first level of implementation. And this first level of implementation is to just the functional view of your system. And you get your data output, um, which is then to be, that needs then to be verified. And you verify it by two steps. The first step is the second layer, where we do a functional monitoring. For example, the redundant calculation, the CRC calculation, and stuff like that. 
And this layer two then um, adds its value to the de saved data output. So we have a validated data. And if the level two detects, okay, something went wrong, we bring the system to the safe state. And third, the third layer is the system feedback and the deadline monitoring. We do that normally in our industry by feeding back sensor data um, or, for example, by ensuring that real-time behavior does work. And this is really proven in use for many, many um, topics. And in our opinion, to apply such a system on a Linux system, on a pure functional view, will allow us um, to, point to cover out the Linux process area from defining the system. But, and that's the but, you really need to understand your complete system. If in your system engineering something went wrong, and that may happen because we are mankind, we are making um, wrong decisions, then um, probably you will have later on a problem. And that, is, that leads me to the, to the open points we need to tackle um, to really get a SLB working um, in a car. So first of all, um, if someone from you um, attended Mr. Bulwan's uh, talk yesterday from BMW, um, he um, described about the certification of um, complex systems in the Seal to Linux project. So what I pointed out is if we are not able to tackle everything in the system engineering area, it would be a good idea to have a certified um, safe Linux operating system to reduce the rest risk also in case of problems. The other thing um, which, are, which I did not point it out is we have a complex loop system. So imagine the case your car is running to the traffic light. The traffic light provides its uh, data correctly, but the car is not behaving in the correct way. That could be, for example, the traffic light expects the car to decelerate but the car that does not decelerate, it powers the f complete speed again, um, uh, it don't slow down. And for that, we need also a feedback loop from the car to the traffic light, where then the traffic light is able to react. And that leads me to the last thing is, um, in future transportation and um, future traffic, it will be very, very important define o to define overall system states for complex systems. So to stay on the example of the car that is not decelerating on the red traffic light, in the case a traffic light detects such a wrong behavior, there could be a solution to put every traffic light to red in the junction, so the car that is not decelerating could run over the um, junction with a less risk of collid colliding with other cars. So there are open questions. The certification of Linux, the feedback loops, and the system complex states will be a big obstacle we need to handle in the, fast, in the, f in the past, in the coming years. Um, but I think that are problems we may solve, um, and it's not a blocking point anymore. So let's come to the conclusion of my talk. I pointed out embedded Linux is making a clear push also to core automotive systems. There are challenges, we know them. Um, there is license obligations, there's real-time behavior, and there's also the ASIL conform conformity, but I am sure we are able to tackle that. By introducing a functional view and get a little bit away from the process orient orientation our um, business normally does, um, Linux, Linux isn't, isn't anymore the blocking point. Um, it's an additional point, but it's not the blocking point anymore. And I think a three-layered monitoring concept may be attached to any system. It may be an automotive system or any other system at all. These three-layered uh, monitoring concepts are proven in use. There are many examples available how to implement this. It's a good abstraction of how a monitoring system works so that you may train your engineers how to do a three-layered monitoring approach and then you are able to handle a system view of safe behavior. And last but not least, there are challenges. So our industry is normally not known for upstreaming software into open source projects. Um, we are not able to, for example, push um, Linux 
into real-time behavior by just working alone. And from my opinion, what needs to be is our industry needs to open to the community. We do that by, for example, supporting uh, projects like the OSADL project or the IGL. Um, and we need to learn how to stream and contribute software to the open source community. And um, I think we need your help because there are many, many obstacles we need to solve and we are not able to solve them by, by our own. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions about this talk, um, you, you may contact me. Um, I'd like to thank my, my two co-authors, Jan Christian Arnold and Hans Leo Ross, um, who had, did me a great help for preparing this presentation. And um, I think we have time to have two or three questions here in the audience or afterwards if you like to. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, um, yeah, sure. So the question was, um, what's with the security of the system? To, um, to have a communication between a car and a traffic light um, is a possible way to attack the system. And to do it in a correct way, for example, using an HMAC, is an open point. So that was the question? Yes. So what I did here is just a safety um, view to it. It's not a point of security view. Um, in my industry, sometimes you hear the uh, theme, safety and security are the same. And no, they influence each other, but they are not the same. And really, you need to have a good um, system on security side for that, and you need to do that. But it's a side activity, and it's another complexity. Okay? Okay. The question was, um, if you have a um, if you have a, f a functional safety system and your Linux is not um, working in a correct way, then you may not ensure the complete um, integrity. Correct. So um, the key for that is the the third entity. You may remember the microcontroller. So we heavily depend on this microcontroller um, that is the referee for the complete system. So it needs to. It really needs to. Um, monitor and observe the Linux system, and if this is working in a wrong way, then you're out. So on calculation based, that helps you not on calculation based errors. Um, but I'm quite confident that in the system like Linux and how we use it, that this is working on calculation based as an operating system on the correct way. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So the Linux part in this point of view is QA. And um, the monitoring and the um, second microcontroller is then an ESL system. And that is what, for example, um, um, was the point of um, yesterday. So the SIL to Linux, that is where you try to bring also a um, validation to the Linux system so that you may also handle it as an ESL software, or in this case, a SIL software. So any other questions? One, one last. Okay, so the question was, um, what about hypervisors? Is a hypervisor a possibility to um, get rid of the microcontroller? Correct? Um, so what we do is in the vehicle computing campus at Bosch is that we are really working with hypervisors where we use um, different operating systems on one device. Um, but our, our industry is a very... Um, um, very uh, industry which is not handling big risks. So even if you take a look to today's um, systems we develop, like the vehicle computer we develop at Bosch, 
We always have a microcontroller on it where you put real-time data on it. Um, latest, for example, if you like to do real-time communication via, for example, the CAN bus or FlexRay, then probably you need also such a device to handle this communication. So I think in the near future we will not uh, miss out the microcontroller, but probably five years or six years or ten years ahead we will see something like that. Okay. Then thank you for your questions. If there are any more, just feel free to come over and have a nice rest of the day. Bye.